Hello and welcome back to Nunley Math. I'm your host, Aaron Nunley. I want to thank you so much for joining me here today as we begin to transition from a study of exponent rules into a study of exponential functions. Now, if you were a student in my class, you would have already had some experience with exponential functions earlier in the year in our functions unit. During that unit, we looked at several different types of functions and we talked about how functions behave and certain patterns that emerge in functions. Um, and then after that, we spent some time talking about linear functions specifically. We're going to do something similar to that with the exponential function, where we're going to look at these in greater detail. And then later on in the year, we'll do the same thing with quadratic functions. But for now, our focus is going to be on the exponential function. Now, if you were given a function like this, where we say graph f of x equals 2 to the x power minus 9, if you had gone through our functions unit, you would realize that most of the time when we begin graphing functions, most of us start off by creating some kind of a table where we insert a value in for x, and then we calculate to find the y or f of x, and we plot that point on our graph. And then once we have enough points to see the pattern, we connect the dots to show all the values that are in between that might be decimals or fractions. But in our functions unit, we said that really is the um, the slowest and least efficient way to graph a function. What's much more useful is for us to be able to look at the function and begin to identify characteristics that might help us graph the function faster. For example, whenever I start graphing a function, I always ask myself first, what type is it? Now, in our case today, it's very obvious this is going to be an exponential function because that is the name of the slideshow. However, if this problem was given to us in a different setting, I could still tell this was going to be an exponential function because when I look at it, I can see that my x is in my exponent. That is, a, um, that is actually the key feature of an exponential function, if your x is in the exponent. So you always want to look for that and identify the type. Once I know the type of function it is, I can go back and um, I can ask myself, what shape does that function make? Each function family has certain patterns that tend to emerge. Exponential functions always make basically the same shape. It looks something like this, and I apologize that uh, is not drawn well. It was drawn by hand with my mouse, um, and that is very difficult to do. Um, they'll all look like this. Now, there might be some subtle differences. For example, the steepness can change. We could flip it upside down. Um, we could actually turn it backwards, but it's always going to make this same basic shape. Exponential functions tend to grow slowly, but then increase their rate of growth so they grow faster, 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 faster as you go farther to the right. Or if we're reading to the left, they tend to get slower, 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 or less steep until they become almost horizontal. They go from almost horizontal to almost vertical, but not quite. Every exponential function is going to look something like that. And then the specifics of the function will control which direction it goes and will control the steepness and whether it's upside down and so on and so forth. So whenever you begin with a function, you want to identify what type it is. Then you want to identify what the graph will look like. We've done both of those things. I'm still not going to come over here and graph because there's still a lot of pieces of information that I have. For example, the question asks me over here to give the domain of the function. The domain is which values of x will work if I plug them in. We can get that information from the graph because I know this is going to go forever to the right and it's going to go forever to the left. The x-axis is right and left on our coordinate plane. So if I were to graph this, I know it's going to start way over here into infinity. It's going to go to the right and it's going to go start going up and it's going to curve up and go to the right for infinity. Every possible x on the number line is going to work. So I can express the domain as every x works as long as that x is a real number. Basically, every number you stick in is going to give you some kind of a solution. If I wanted to talk about the range, the range is what y values will work, or in this case, what f of x values will work. 
f of x is identified on the y-axis in our coordinate plane. So basically the range is saying where along the y-axis or where up and down does this graph go? Well we already said it's going to go up and to the right forever. And it's going to come down, 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 down until it's almost horizontal. In fact, this is going to keep going down forever, but there is a point it will never, ever cross. And I can find that in my exponential function. Do you see this minus 9 at the end? This minus 9 tells me how far my exponential function will go down. Every y will work, or every f of x will work, as long as it is a number bigger than negative 9. Now, if you did not go through the functions unit, you might be asking yourself how I know that. We'll, go, we'll backtrack on that in just a second. I'll explain that to you after we have our graph. For those of us that have done the functions unit and already know this, it does make the process a whole lot easier because it tells me where up and down I'm not allowed to go. That's called an asymptote. This says I'm going to go up forever, but I'm going to only go down um, as far as negative 9. But I'm never actually going to reach negative 9. There's a dotted line called an asymptote that tells me where I'm not allowed to touch. In this case, y equals negative 9 is the equation of that horizontal line. I know this graph is going to go up forever, but it's only going to come down to negative 9 without ever touching it. For those of you that have never done functions before, I'll go back and show you how I knew that in just a moment. The vertex of a function is the point where it stops its behavior or changes. We said it's going to increase its speed forever or decrease its speed forever, it does not change, so this does not have a vertex. The y-intercept is the point where it crosses the y-axis. At this point, I am going to go ahead and start using my table because I know my y-intercept is what value do I get for y when x is a zero. If I were to take a zero and plug it into 2 to the x power minus 9, everybody should know that 2 to the 0 power is a 1, minus 9 gives me a negative 8. 0, negative 8 is the coordinate where I'm going to touch the y-axis. Now, last thing I want to make sure I talk about is symmetries. Um, there is nowhere I can draw a line where one side is a reflection of the other, and if I were to try and spin this in a circle, it will never match each other until it makes a full circle, so this has no symmetries. By the way, Every exponential function has a domain of all real numbers. Every exponential function does not have a vertex. And every exponential function does not have any symmetry. There again, I know that from having done several of these and examined them. I'll show, uh, I'll show you guys how I knew that once we get a few more points on the table. Now, once I have this first point, I know my graph is going to start off down here it's going to come up and approach this point, and it's going to get steeper, 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 steeper until I run out of room. Sorry, I accidentally clicked my mouse there. All I need to do is find a couple points in order to see the pattern. So I'm going to start here at the zero, and I'm just going to pick some points that are near this. This is when x equals 1. So I'm going to stick a 1 into my function. 2 to the first power is 2 minus 9 is negative 7. The coordinate 1 negative 7 is a solution to this function. Let's pick another one. If I stick in a 2, 2 to the second power is 4, minus 9 is negative 5. That's another solution to this function. If I stick in a 3, I get 2 to the third power minus 9. 2 to the third power is 8, minus 9 makes negative 1. So 3, negative 1 is a solution. Notice, just like we predicted, it started off growing slowly, but now it's growing faster. If I stick in a 4, 2 to the 4th power is 16, minus 9 is 7. So I graph that point. Notice it's still getting steeper. In fact, it's getting steep enough that I can tell that it's going to run out of room before it reaches my next point. So I'm going to go back and do this other side. I'm going to stick in a negative one. 
If you put in a negative one, you have two to the negative first power. Two to the negative first says use the reciprocal of two, which is one half, minus nine, which is negative eight and a half. And I put that point here. If I stick in a negative two, two to the negative two says use the reciprocal, so this is one half squared. One half squared is one fourth. One fourth minus nine is negative eight and three fourths and I have this point here. You can see again as I move to the right it's getting steeper, steeper, steeper. As I move to the left, left it's getting less steep, less steep, and less steep. I'll go ahead and do one more point. If I stick in a negative 3 I get negative 8 and 7 8. Notice it's getting less steep. A um, couple things I want to point out. When I started off at 0 and I went to 1 Notice that my rate of increase went up 1 over 1. But when I go from x being a 1 to being a 2, when I go from this dot to this dot, notice it doesn't rise 1, it rises 2. And then from the next dot to the next dot, did you notice it went up 4? And then up 8? Look at that pattern. 1, 2, 4, 8. Any idea what the next rate of growth will be? It's going to go up 16. So I would end up with the point 5, let's see, this is at 7, 5, 23. These numbers are really interesting to me. Up 1, up 2, up 4, up 8, up 16, because when I draw my graph, I've gone up 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1st is 2, 2 to the 2nd is 4, 2 to the 3rd is 8, and 2 to the 4th is 16. Notice it's growing faster and faster because as my exponent is changing, it's creating a larger and larger rate of change. It grew 1, it grew 2, it grew 4, it grew 8, it grew 16. If I do that backwards, think about it this way. Going from here, I've gone down 16 to here, down 8, down 4, down 2, down 1. If I follow that pattern, the next thing would be down a half, down a fourth, down an eighth, down a sixteenth, down a thirty-second. I'm always going up or down by powers of two. Because of that, I'm always going down smaller and smaller amounts. I go down a thirty-second, a sixty-fourth, a one-twenty-eighth. I'm going down smaller and smaller increments so that I'm never, ever, ever going to reach this asymptote. This is how I knew ahead of time that I would never reach negative nine because I'm always going to have a tiny little fraction minus nine. Now this fraction is going to get infinitely small, but any number that's positive minus 9 will end up being something slightly larger than 9. By the way, please forgive my handwritten uh, sketch here. It really should be a lot ne neater than that, but that's very difficult to do with the mouse. Here's your graph. Notice we were able to predict before we ever started plotting points what this was going to look like. I want to do a couple more of these. Um, to, to, to kind of illustrate the point a little bit. Notice that we started at this point 0, um, negative 8. That's a typo. I started at this point 0, negative 8, and then I grew by powers of 2. In general, if we look at the vertex form of an exponential function, the steepness of the function is always controlled by the number in front of my... Um, my, my exponent term, or my b to a certain power. Anything I do to the exponent is going to control right and left, and anything I do to the end of my function is going to control up and down. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over uh, why this is true. There again, that's a part of our functions unit and should be familiar to students in my class. If you're uncomfortable with that, you may want to go back and watch some of the videos from the functions unit. Over here are some illustrations. Notice that if I have 2 to the x power, it looks like this, but if I change the number in front, it grows four times as fast and becomes steeper. That's what this number here does.
Notice as well that if my base number is a fraction, my entire graph, instead of growing, will shrink by exponents. And also notice that if you use a negative sign in front of your function, it causes the entire thing to reflect across the x-axis. There again, these are patterns that my students should be familiar with. Here's another one. We'll do it again. Uh, y equals 4 times 2 to the x minus 3 plus 2. It says give the domain and range. Here's what I would do first. I first want to ask myself, what type is it? Notice my x is in my exponent, so I know it's going to be exponential. And then I'm going to ask myself what shape it makes. I know this is going to be a curve, just like the last one, because all exponential functions are going to make a curve. I'm also aware that the domain is all real numbers, because this graph is going to go to the right forever, and it's going to go to the left forever. I brought the function down, all I've done is copied it. I want to look at the different pieces we just talked about in the last slide. This 4 is in the A position and is going to control the steepness of my graph. So when I look at my particular exponential function, it's going to look like this, but it's going to be 4 times as steep as it would ordinarily be. I'm going to look at this x minus 3. My goal is to make this into a 0. So a 3 is going to make this into a 0. That means if I stick a 3 into this function, over here at positive 3 on the x-axis, the thing that would have occurred at 0 is going to occur. In other words, my 0 dot has shifted 3 spaces to the right. And lastly, I have this plus 2 at the end. Remember, that value controls up and down. That tells me that the entire graph is going to get shifted two spaces up. Well, that's helpful because in the last problem, my, um, my, or my range was all x values as long as x is greater than negative 9. This is not correct anymore. This time, I'm going to have values that are greater than 2. So that's where my asymptote is going to go. So I'm going to get a graph that looks like this, except it's going to be higher than normal. The whole thing is going to be shifted three spaces to the right, and it's going to be steeper than I would normally expect to see it. Now, because 3 is what made this a 0, I am going to stick a 3 into my table first. 4 times 2 to the 3 minus 3 plus 2. Order of operations uh, says deal with this exponent first. 3 minus 3 is 0. 2 to the 0 power is 1. 4 times 1 is 4. Add the 2, and I get a 6. So 3, 6 is a dot that's going to be on my graph. I'm going to pick things that are close to that. Maybe stick in a 4. If I were to stick a 4, into this function, 4 minus 3 is 1, 2 to the first is 2, times 4 is 8, plus 2 makes 10. Notice that 410 is a point on the graph. Now I can already tell, since I know this is going to curve, that this is going to end up being off my graph, so I'm going to start coming the other direction from my other dots, maybe stick in a positive 2. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. 2 to the negative first power is a half. 4 times a half is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. 2, 4 is going to be in my graph. Let's do one more. If I were to stick in a 1, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. 2 to the negative 2 says use the reciprocal, so it's 1 half squared or 1 fourth. 1 fourth times 4 is 1, plus 2 makes a 3. And there is my dot. Now, you can already begin to see how this curve is starting to look like we said it would. Notice that it's up here. It goes down 4. Then it goes down 2. Then it goes down 1. Do you see the pattern? Down 4. Down 2. Down 1. Each progression, this direction, is half as steep as it was before. That means the next time I'm going to go down a half. Then I'm going to go down a fourth, 
then an eighth, then a sixteenth, then a thirty-second. Notice I'm forever approaching the asymptote, but I never cross it. There's my attempt at drawing that real nice and neat. Uh, again, with the mouse, that's fairly difficult, but you're done. It's nice to know ahead of time what this graph could look like, because if I make a calculation error, um, it makes it a lot easier to spot it. Now, my suggestion to you at this point is to try and do the same thing for these two graphs. My recommendation is that you pause the video and try them on your own. If you're still uncomfortable with that, you can go ahead and watch along with me, and we will do it together. As always, I want to know what type it is, and as always for this lesson, it is exponential because the x is in the exponent. And because it's exponential, it's going to make that same shape that we've expected it to make all along. So, my domain for exponential functions is always all row numbers because this is going to go to the right forever, it's going to go to the left forever. I want to start looking at the pieces of this function. Notice there's a negative 2 in the front. Remember, that spot controls the steepness of my graph. This is going to go two times as fast as it normally does. But notice this negative sign right here. That's going to flip my entire graph over. So that instead of looking like this, it's going to look like this. Anything that would have been positive above my asymptote is now going to be negative below my asymptote. Notice here that my base is a 3, so I'm going to be growing by powers of 3. Notice that I have an x plus 2. A negative 2 is what's going to make that into a 0, so my entire graph is going to move two spaces to the left. And then here at the end I have that minus 1, which is going to move the entire graph down one space. It's nice because that tells me where my asymptote is, which then will lead me to my range. Notice this time, I'm going to go down forever, and I'm going to come up towards the asymptote forever. Because of that, my range is going to be values that are smaller than my asymptote. Notice the asymptote's at negative 1. I'm going to be forever beneath that line, so my y's will always be y's that are smaller than negative 1. As before, since negative 2 is what makes this into a 0, I'm going to start my table with a negative 2 and plug in my value. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. We mentioned that before. Anything to the 0 power is a 1. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Minus 1 gives me negative 3. And I can plot that point. I'm going to pick points that are near that, so let's go with a negative 1. I plug that in. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1. 3 to the first is 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. Minus 1 makes negative 7. And I can graph that. If I stick in a 0, 0 plus 2 is 2. 3 squared is 9 times negative 2 is negative 18. Minus 1 makes negative 19. And I'm going to end up with a dot way, way down here. Notice, by the way, I can already see that it's making the graph I predicted it would make. It's starting to come up and over, and it's going to continue to curve this way. Since I'm off the graph on the right, let's pick some points to the left. Um, how about negative 3? Negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. 3 to the negative third says use the reciprocal, so that's 1 third. Negative 2 times 1 third is negative 2 thirds. Negative 2 thirds minus 1 is negative 1 and 2 thirds, which gives me a dot right here. Negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. 3 to the negative second says use the reciprocal, that's 1 third squared, that's 1 ninth. Negative 2 times 1 ninth is negative 2 ninths. Negative 2 ninths minus 1 is negative 1 and 2 ninths, which gives you that dot. And I think that's probably sufficient for us to see um, where this is headed. We know it's going to forever get closer and closer to the asymptote. Um, notice, by the way, that I don't bother to, to list all these out because once I can see the pattern, it gets kind of difficult to distinguish visually the, the difference between a 16th and a 32nd and a 64th or something like that. Do notice, though, that this is not, uh, a third followed by a ninth. The next one, by the way, would be negative 1 and 2 27ths followed by negative 1 and 2 81st. Notice the value 
there. That is not an accident. Also make sure when you draw these that you put arrows on the end showing that it does go forever both directions. I think this is the last one of these we're going to graph. Uh, I do want to rem remind you that this is exponential because the x is in the exponent. It is going to make that same basic curve shape. The domain is still going to be all real numbers because it goes right and left forever. And then I'm going to start looking for my key points. Notice that this does not have a number, so it's just a 1. So it's just going to be a regular, uh, a regular curve. It's not going to be any steeper or less steep than I would normally expect it to be. Notice that it's x by itself, so it's not going to move right or left. I'm going to start my table with a 0. And notice the plus 2 tells me that I'm going to move the entire thing up two spaces which means I'm going to be greater than 2. I know it's going to be greater than 2 because this is a positive 1, which means I'm still going to be above the line. I do want to point out one extra thing. Notice that this time I'm growing by a factor of 0 0.25. 0 0.25 actually doesn't grow. 0 0.25 is going to have a line that shrinks, a line that shrinks as x gets bigger. That means instead of a shape that looks like this, my shape is going to go the other direction. It's going to start off big and it's going to grow by less and less each time. Or the slope is going to go down by um, less and less each time. Let's plug in some values here. If x is a 0 and I plug that in, anything to the 0 powers a 1, add the 2, you get 3, there's your dot. If you plug in a 1, anything to the first power is itself, so this is 0.25. I don't tend to like decimals, so I'm going to call that 1 fourth. 1 fourth plus 2 is 2 and a fourth. If I plug in a 2, I get 1 fourth squared, which is a 16th plus 2, which is 2 and a 16th. And you can already see we're kind of getting to the point where it's indistinguishable, and we know it's just going to get closer and closer forever. I'm going to go ahead and go the other direction then. If I put in a negative 1, I have 1 fourth to the negative 1. Negative 1 says use the reciprocal of 1 fourth, which is 4, plus 2 makes 6, and there's your dot. By the way, it is much easier to do the reciprocal of 1 fourth than it is to do the reciprocal of 0.25. If I plug in a negative 2, I have 1 fourth to the negative second. Negative exponent says use the reciprocal, so instead of 1 fourth, this is now a 4 squared, which is 16 plus 2, which is 18, which is going to be way up off the graph. I just kind of stuck it there. And oops, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and extend this graph, trying to make a nice neat curve as best I can using a mouse. There again, that's kind of how this is going to work. When we're graphing, we want to start with those key characteristics. Look at the function. Let the function tell you what the graph is going to be so you're not just blindly sticking in random points. Now, there are a couple other things I do want to make mention about exponential functions. The first is how the exponential function is going to look in table form compared to the linear function. You can look at what happens when you stick a value in for x. If I were to stick a 0 into this linear function, 2 times 0 is 0 plus 1 is 1. If I stick a 1 in, 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. If I take a 2 and stick it in, 2 times 2 plus 1 is 5 and 7 and 9. Notice that you have a constant rate of growth. I grow by plus 2 every single time. That's a key feature of these linear functions. They always grow at a constant rate. Linear grows at a constant rate. But that is not the case over here with the exponential function. If I were to stick a 0 into this function, 2 to the 0 power is 1 plus 1 makes 2. If I stick a 1 into this function, 2 to the first power is 2 plus 1 makes 3. 2 to the second power is 4 plus 1 makes 5. 2 to the third power is 8 plus 1, which is 9. And 2 to the fourth power is 16 plus 1 makes 17. Notice you're not growing by the same amount every single time. The first time you grew by 1, then you grew by 2, then you grew by 4, then you grew by 8. The rate of change keeps growing changing. In fact, notice the first time was a 1, the second time was a 2, that's a growth of 1. The second time it grew, it went from a 2 to a 4, it grew by 2. Then it grew by 4. 
These numbers are very interesting to me because each time it doubles. This was a growth of 1, it doubled and became a growth of 2, then it doubled and became a growth of 4. And then it would double again and the next time it would be a growth of 8. So we would expect this to grow by 16. That's what exponential is going to do. It's always going to grow at a rate that's constantly increasing, but that rate of increase is always going to be um, multiplying by another number. It's always going to be multiplying by the same. In this case, it's multiplying by a 2. Now, since I know this is a 2, I know it's going to be 2 to a certain power. You see this 2 here? But if I were to do 2 to the first power, that's a 2. I need 1 extra to make the 3. 2 to the second power is 4. I'd need the 1 extra to make a 5. I can actually use this strategy right over here to figure out the exponential function from the table. Let's take a look at this. Is this first one here linear or exponential? You can pause the video if you need to think about that for a second, but we can tell by looking at the rate of change. Notice it grew 8, 8, 8, 8. It is linear. In fact, since my rate of change is 8 and my starting point was a 12, I can give the linear function f of x equals 8x plus 12 very quickly and easily. What about that second one? 6, 8, 14, 32, 86. Is that a constant rate of change? It is not. In fact, it grows by 2, then by 6, then by 18, and then by 54. It is not a constant rate of change. The rate of change continues to increase. In fact, there was an increase of 4 between the first two, an increase of 12 between the second two, and an increase of 36 between the next two. Do you notice anything interesting about 4, 12, and 36? I'm multiplying by 3 each time which means the next time is going to be a growth of 108, and a growth of 108 would make this, I believe, 162. This is going to be exponential. Now, if I wanted to, the question didn't ask me to do this, but if I wanted to, I could actually give this exponential function, now that I know it's being multiplied by 3 each time, this is going to be f of x equals 3 to the x power. Now, 3 to the 0 doesn't equal 6. 3 to the 0 equals 1. I'd need an additional 5 to get to the 6. 3 to the first is 3, plus 5 makes 8. 3 to the second is six, or sorry, is um, 9, plus 5 makes 14. 3 to the third is 27, plus 5 is 32. 3 to the fourth is 81, plus 5 equals 86. Once I find this number right here, writing the function is very easy. How about this last one? Is this linear or is this exponential? Well, it grew 3, 12, 48, and 192. That's a growth of 9, 36, and 144. Do you see the pattern there? My rate of growth is changing by times 4 every time, giving me a, um, a plus 576 the next time. I can write an exponential function for this one. Since it's times 4 every time, I know that 4 is my base. 4 to the 0 power is 1. 1 uh, minus 5 is negative 4. 4 to the first is 4. Minus 5 is negative 1. 4 squared is 16. Minus 5 is 11. 4 to the third is 64. Minus 5 is 59. 4 to the fourth is 256. Minus 5 is 251. We can actually create our exponential function once we know this pattern. Now, there is one other set of things that I need to make sure I talk about. Um, this is not uh, as complex as what you've just been doing. This is actually much, much easier, and it's just evaluating the expression. Remember, if you have an equation and you're asked to evaluate for a given value, in this case, x is 3, all that means is to plug in the 3 where you think, or where the x is, and simplify using order of operations. 5 to the third is 125 times the negative 2 is negative 250. 
Over here in example B, I'm going to put a negative 2 in where the x was. I don't like 0 0.5, so I'm going to go with 1 half. The reason for that is a negative sign says use the reciprocal. 2 squared is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. I'd recommend you pause the video, try the last two on your own. I don't think you'll find them to be too hard. Um, I'll go ahead and do that for you, um, assuming you've done that with uh, already. I plug in my negative 2. I use the reciprocal. 1 ninth squared is 1 over 81 times 2 is 2 over 81. On the last one, I plug 1 half in 4x. Remember, in our last lesson, we said that something to the 1 half is just the square root. The square root of 16 is 4, and 1.5 times 4 is 6. Once again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video with us today. Make sure you leave us a comment in the comment section if this was helpful to you. Make sure you like and subscribe, and uh, make sure you turn on those notifications so you don't miss any of the algebra coming to you from Nunley Math. As, all, we wish you, or as always, we wish you the very best. You guys take care of yourself. Have a good day. Bye-bye.